Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist working in Alaska at the moment, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today I'm going to go over some ideas about the soapstone vessels that were once manufactured in the Appalachian region and have been recovered from sites as far distant as Louisiana in the southwest and southern Canada in the north. I've talked about these soapstone vessels before. It's a very soft metamorphic rock common to Appalachia, and it can be easily carved into all kinds of vessel shapes. There are things like bowls and pipes and things like that. Once soapstone took off as a technology in the archaic period, it started getting traded around, and for a long time it was thought that soapstone bowls predated pottery as vessel technology in the region. But then in the kind of the 1990s, there was some new evidence that started to suggest that really, really early pottery came first along the Atlantic coast. And then in the mid-2000s, the whole witch came first question turned into a bit of a fight between two researchers, James Truncer and Ken Sassaman. If you've been following the channel uh, for any amount of time, Sassaman's name should be kind of familiar at least. He dabbles in most of the same kinds of questions that I'm interested in. So understand for this episode, I'm explaining an academic debate. Um, I'm explaining the arguments that each researcher was making at the time, and some of the arguments are good and others are more thin, so keep that in mind. I'm going to start kind of in the middle with James Troncer's ideas. Um, he looked at soapstone from a functional perspective, so what are these things for, why did they take off as a tool type when they did, and how did they function? And in his analysis, there's a relationship between which soapstone outcrops were used to quarry this, this material and the presence or absence of mast hardwood forest. And I've talked about the importance of mast like acorn and hickory nut in the diets of Eastern North Americans in antiquity before. And you'll find a link for those videos down in the description. Now, but just kind of to, to briefly recap, mast is extremely nutritious and can be stored for long periods of time if it gets roasted to kill off any parasites but it also requires a lot of time and energy in order to process it into edible food. Acorns especially are really high in tannins that make them very bitter, and if you eat too much of it, it'll upset your stomach. So in order to make them edible, you have to boil them in fresh water several times, boiling and straining and boiling and straining, in order to extract those tannins. And once that's done, they can be dried and ground into flour to make bread or thickened soups, uh, anything like that. Acorn flour can basically be used pretty much the same way as cornmeal can and any other recipe. Um, now without either ceramic or soapstone bowls to um, do, that, do this boiling, the only way to do it was to fill baskets or pits with water and then drop fire-heated rocks into the water uh, along with the shelled nuts until eventually the water starts boiling. That hot rock boiling method is much less efficient than placing a bowl directly over the fire. So that's what Truncer was thought was going on with these soapstone bowls. This is um, especially because the right kind of soapstone was readily available in the area around Vermont and New Hampshire, but it wasn't quarried in, in that area. In the late archaic, the region was dominated by evergreens that don't produce mast. But other areas in New England, like Massachusetts, have both soapstone and deciduous forests. And those outcrops were quarried for the material, but not directly. So like in Massachusetts, the west side of the state has the quarries. The east side of the state, around like Cape Cod, um, that's where all the, the mass trees are. So they, they're getting quarried and then brought in from the, uh, from the uplands. Trons are seeing a close relationship between the people who are using soapstone and the availability of mast in general. When soapstone was traded out from the region within quarries, it appears exclusively to be going to places that have mast. Um, so oak hickory mixed forests. So places like New York State, Cape Cod, that, that Cape Cod Bay Area, and even the northern parts of Florida. Apart from sites associated with Poverty Point, uh, these vessels were also rare west of the Appalachians. Um, the Oak Hickory Forest is still there. In fact, it's plentiful, but there are no local outcrops. Um, in some of these western areas like Tennessee and northern Alabama, 
people were making counterfeit vessels out of sandstone instead of soapstone. They look basically similar, but uh, sandstone is much less effective for this function because they break from repeated heating and cooling much faster than soapstone will. Now, because this is archaeology, we have to pay really close attention to the chronology, and this is where the debate really heated up. As of 2012, Sassaman and Anderson are still reluctant to project the manufacture of soapstone back before about 4,200 years ago, but Schroncer ran a date on um, uh, the uh, soapstone bowl that it had carbon caked up on the side. It's basically soot. And he ran a date on that from Pennsylvania that came back around 4,900 years ago. And he also puts forward a series of other radiocarbon dates associated with soapstone vessels that suggested to him that this, uh, this technology did, in fact, predate the invention of pottery. So a couple of years later, uh, Ken Sassaman wrote a rebuttal to Troncer's soapstone came first bottle. And for the next little bit, I'm just explaining Sassaman's arguments. First, at the Gaston site in North Carolina, Sassaman points out that the radiocarbon dates that Co uh, Joffrey Coe ran uh, when they were excavated came from the charcoal from three different fire pits that were put together. And that soapstone, um, the soapstone vessels that he's associating those dates with actually come from the stratum above those hearths. So they're necessarily later. Uh, back in the day, large samples were required to do radiocarbon dating. So uh, before we use like mass spectrometry to run dates on small samples. So back, back then you had to aggregate several radiocarbon samples. And so what you're getting is kind of an average. So that's gonna throw your, your date into a bit of ambiguity right there. Um, so the aggregation of those three hearths reduces the precision of those dates, and the artifacts themselves weren't really in direct contact with those hearths. They were from the stratum above. Um, so that for for Ken for Ken Sassman, he he thought the use of the Gaston uh, specimens was was really dubious because the dates just aren't good. Um, they were deposited on the site after those fires were burned. So those dates don't really mean anything with relationship to the, the actual soapstone. Now, at the Warren Wilson site, also in North Carolina, um, a stratum called Zone C contains soapstone fragments, and the oldest dates associated with that zone are the ones that Truncer used uh, to date the soapstone. And Sassman considered that inappropriate because a stratum is not formed all at once. They often form over very long periods of time. So according to Sassaman's argument, trying to associate those vessels with the oldest dates available for that strat is artificially pushing the date for the soapstone back without any real good justification. Like I talked about in the, the Methods and Madness video, it's, it's the pit features that you really want to get secure dates from. Also, Zone C contained early woodland Swannanoa style pottery sherds, so that would push that pottery back just as far as the soapstone. So it doesn't really help to answer the question of, um, if soapstone or uh, ceramics came first, which, uh, you know, we really shouldn't try to try to push the ceramic back either for all the reasons that I just explained. Sassman also argues that because the woodland zone B and the archaic zone C didn't really have a clear, well, a well-defined boundary between the two, it's a very diffuse transition, um, and also woodland people dug pit features for storage and cooking and so on, just like archaic people did, the the idea that some of these contexts are a little mixed up in the uh, in the the boundary can't be really ruled out either. So you also have to consider the burrowing animals might have dragged smaller fragments down. It's it's really never quite so simple as it came from this strat, it came from that strat, and those are the dates. It that's a, a general framework, but um, in terms of actually getting really precise dates, we really have to go after pit features and not cluster features or just raw stratigraphy. I could go on with his like kind of point by point uh, critiques of the radiocarbon dates that Truncer chose, but you, you get the idea. Sassman thought that Truncer was trusting dates that shouldn't be trusted and massaging the data to push soapstone back before pottery when the evidence isn't really that clear cut. His last critique of Truncer is on how he used soot that had caked up on the outside of a bowl fragment to get a mass spec radiocarbon date. And he uses it, it's not the date itself, but it's anomalous. Um, it's the only one that we've got. He doesn't have any real good corroborating dates from other sites or other contexts within the site. So 
It was anomaly at the time of this that this debate was going on. As uh, as far as I know, it still is that soot could have been created by wood from very old trees, let or uh, driftwood, wood scavenged from old house structures, um, or just a particularly old tree. You can't really draw these huge sweeping conclusions based on a single radiocarbon date like that, and argue that there was any sort of uh, soapstone vessel tradition affiliated with that one date. It's it's just not strong enough evidence. So Sassman goes on to question some of Truncer's fundamental theoretical frameworks. And Truncer's original argument was effectively that soapstone bowls were invented so that archaic peoples could finally start using acorn mast as an effective food source. But those people were using acorn mast long before soapstone and other kinds of mast. And when soapstone did finally show up, they were using early pottery to process it at the exact same time. So it's it's not really so much that the, the soapstone is the only only way of um, processing these materials. Um, he's also asking if, if soapstone was so prosaic and utilitarian, then why do we find it on sites in the Sandhill regions of the Piedmont where you don't really get oak mass that these, these vessels are allegedly for processing? Um, the, the correlation wasn't as direct as Truncer had made it out to be. Now, Sassaman's theoretical framework is much more oriented towards social interactions and explanations between geographically and culturally diverse groups. That's kind of his whole, whole shtick. And in his model, Soapstone wasn't just a technological advancement. It also had social and political implications. Those are due largely to the labor cost and the time cost of transporting those heavy stone bowl objects across long distances. They're still made out of rock. They're very heavy. And Sassman's argument is that having soapstone vessels was a way of demonstrating that you or your community had connections to people and places that were very far away and signaled affluence and interconnectedness. They're kind of a status symbol and a form of social currency under Sassman's model. But even beyond that, Ken is noting that some groups are using soapstone and others are choosing not to. And he suggests that we should consider the possibility that the use of soapstone was a marker of group identity on some level. So just trying to think of, of more modern analogies for something similar. Today you can be like an iPhone person or an Android person, or you can be a pork barbecue person or a Texas barbecue person, or you can cook with nonstick pans or cast iron pans, and people kind of like are attached to the the use of the one or the other as uh, correct or appropriate, and they attach identity to those things. Now, going back to Tronser, he published his own rebuttal um, about the, he published his own rebuttal to Sassaman's uh, counterpoints. Now, regarding the the Gaston site, he acknowledges that the old dates had um, the old dates that he had been using were probably invalid, but also that the uh, there are soapstone bearing contexts that don't have ceramics in them early on, and argues that this means that at this site in particular, soapstone predates pottery, and that's fine. It doesn't really push soapstone. Um, prior to pottery in general, just at this particular site, and no, that's a, that's a maybe. Um, his reevaluation of the Warren Wilson site is a bit more um, questionable. He mischaracterizes Sassaman's argument and claims that Ken thinks that if two strata contain soapstone, but B contained more than C, then only B's dates are valid, and that really wasn't Ken's argument about that site at all. He was really questioning the dating because of the poor association between the carbon sample and the artifacts themselves, and that it appeared as though that um, kind of interface between zone B and zone C were very undulating and diffuse and not really well separated the way that we would want them to be if we're trying to make uh, this kind of chicken or the egg argument. Now, as to my own assessment of this situation, I think that Ken has the right of it for the most part with the data we have available at this point. If people really were making soapstone vessels deep into the archaic period, we should be finding them in more secure contexts than a single fragment sitting on top of a rock pile or 
in low numbers and a, in a sandy stratum that is undulating and diff difficult to differentiate from the, the strata above. They should be showing up at the bottom of refuse pits or in the ashes at the bottom of fire pits from vessels that have chi chips knocked off or fragments broken off from the constant heating and cooling involved with their use. I think it's a much more likely scenario that for a long time people did hot rock boiling either in baskets or boiling pits. Then some people started making clay pots along that Atlantic coast for indirect boiling with that those hot rocks the same way that they were using the basket. So it was basically just a different kind of basket for them. Then they found that they could use those pots directly over fire and it worked faster, but copies of those made out of soapstone would survive that process for much longer so they wouldn't have to remake their cooking pots as, as frequently. But then the trade networks required to acquire those soapstone vessels gave them an added level of social signaling that locally made and, and cheaply made clay pots that couldn't emulate that status symbol element of the soapstone. Which is why people on the west of the Appalachians were forced to make counterfeit sandstone versions because they weren't getting the soapstone, you know, cauldrons or whatever brought in. Now, that said, Truncer is certainly correct that these ves vessels served a prosaic function on the level of um, preparing meals and preparing food for storage. And it should also be, um, he's also right that they should be understood as tools in their own, in their own right. Um, not just status symbols. Also, it's not impossible that better supported radiocarbon dates might turn up at some point, either in reanalysis of boulder sites that have already been, uh, you know, excavated and analyzed. If we need, like a reanalysis of those might uh, turn up some of these things if we're actually looking for that. Or, you know, we also excavate new sites every every year, and we might find more evidence to support Trunsers, um kind of earlier invention model but for the time being the data all seem to point to a, a later post ceramic or ceramic contemporary invention of soapstone vessels and i hope that served to illustrate the kind of things that archaeologists actually argue about um it's never about lost civilizations or any any anything like that um copper copper trade across the atlantic and the in the bronze age of europe anything like that but it's more about how we should interpret and understand the data that we're generating when we excavate these sites. That's all I've got for you this time. If you've got any questions, you can ask those down in the comments. And until next time, thank you for watching.